One of the loveliest things about the garden or visiting parks are the little birds that happily live alongside us. And today I will tell you the folklore of five of our songbird friends. The sparrow, the wren, the robin, the blackbird and the blue tit or titmouse. The Sparrow The Sparrow is such a familiar little fellow and yet sadly in decline around the world. These small brown, cream and black, very chatty and sociable garden birds are probably one of the most seen in the gardens, parks and towns. They are welcome little friends with a cheeky eye and nature. Because sparrows are a social bird, happily living in large flocks and families, they have become in recent times associated with community, hard work and achievement, protection, simplicity and the family structure. In the Celtic era, sparrows were believed to be keepers of ancestral knowledge, intelligent and diligent, and yet by the Middle Ages they were seen as representative of the peasant class probably in both cases because of their family flock structure, keeping together, raucous and industrious. There was a tradition that should a sparrow fly into your window and not survive, it could herald the death of a family member. This was taken to extremes in Old England, where if a person caught a sparrow it must be killed immediately, or a member of the family would die, usually parents. In Indonesia, a sparrow flying into the house predicts a new baby, or a marriage. They predict rain and good news. If a woman should see a sparrow on Valentine's Day, she will marry a poor man and yet be very happy and content. In China, sparrows herald good fortune to the family, and here they are regarded as symbols of happiness and the arrival of spring. There is a general international belief that sparrows can carry the souls of those who have passed away to the other world, and so must never be harmed. This echoes the ancient Egyptian belief, and also that of sailors in times past, who would have a sparrow tattoo marked upon them in case they should die while at sea. Sparrow tattoos were also popular pieces of art, created in memory of family members who have passed away. Other sparrow tattoos have been created to symbolise a desire to live on the fringes of society or beyond normal society, and yet also productivity and adaptability in life. For the ancient Greeks, the sparrow was a bird of love and spirituality, sacred to Aphrodite, and also birds of prophecy. In biblical folklore, they were written as a symbol of God's love for even the smallest of creatures. His love for everything and feature in many, many stories in the Bible, representing the inner will to survive and improve as a community. In works of literature, the tales featuring sparrows range from Japan to India to Europe and beyond. Always the little sparrow is the hero, avenging the wickedness of individuals in acts of injustice. In the Islamic traditional biography of Muhammad, the sparrow is used to teach that not even it, as small as it is, should be harmed, that humans should be kind to all of God's creatures. In the Jewish mystical texts, the sparrows are said to live in the tree of souls in the Garden of Eden, and at the end of the world these little birds will watch the souls and chirp in joy at the return of the Messiah. There is an Eastern European tradition that says, if you want to protect your seed crops from the sparrows, then you must strike a stick upright in a field. This stick must be made from a splinter of wood from which a coffin was created. Next, a bone taken from a grave must be placed on the windowsill or doorway of the barn. Place three grains of corn under your tongue while sowing the row, and at the end of the furrow spit out the corn 
reciting a prayer in the name of the Lord and some such stuff. Not one single sparrow will take your seed or ripe corn, but your neighbour's fields will be full of the flocks. In summary, these tiny, often overlooked birds, full of noise and character, are universally accepted as powerful beyond their size, and the main themes of their place in folklore is a symbol of family, community, perseverance, industriousness and contentment. We all love sparrows. I hope they recover and thrive in the world. It would be a much duller place without them in it. The wren. The smallest of our common garden birds and yet considered the king of all the birds is the tiny, fierce and remarkably loud wren and they have an international folklore pretty hard to beat for such a tiny bird. There are many species of wren around the world which is why it features so highly in folklore. There is a northern European tale that has echoed versions in ancient Jewish texts in India, among the native people of North America and into Africa. This is the story of how the wren became the king of all birds. All the birds of the world met at a secret place, a green valley secluded and quiet, to decide who should be the king of birds. They decided that the bird who flew the highest above the land should be the king. All of the birds attempted the task, each one failed one by one, until it came time for the mighty eagle. He took to the wing, and he flew higher and higher and higher into the sky above all the other birds, almost invisible to the eye. And it was at this point that the clever little wren launched himself from the eagle's back where he had been hiding. The wren jumped in the air and instantly became the king of all the birds, and well deserved too because the king should be clever. However, the eagle did place a spell on the tiny wren, that from that day it would never be able to fly so higher than a hedge. The name king is given to the wren in many countries. In France it is the Ratelet, in Germany it is Zaunkonig, the hedge king, and in Dutch it is known as the winter king. In Devon, in the southwest of England, there are also some brilliant colloquial names Titty Todger, Akimal, Kitty Lodger, Tiddly Tope, Cracky Ran, and Cuddy Bear. Another name for the wren in Devon is Bran Sparrow, and this is an acknowledgement of the bird's importance to the Welsh British Asian hero. Bran the Blessed, whose head is said to lie beneath the site of the Tower of London, in constant protection of the land. Wrens are solitary and territorial birds, and yet in harsh winters when many wrens die of cold because of their tiny size, they will call to other wrens and even other small birds, male or female, to share their nests for warmth. As many as 61 wrens have been found in a nest huddled this way. It has always been believed that to harm a wren will bring immense bad luck. They are sacred birds, and yet early Christians considered it a bird of evil. These people knew the wren was sacred to the ancient pagan folk, and in Ireland and on the Isle of Man, the poor little bird was hunted on the 26th of December, St. Stephen's Day, and what became known as Wren Day. This was a punishment for betraying St. Stephen to his persecutors and him becoming a martyr. In the story it was said that the wren alert called as the saint hid in the bushes. The wren had no chance. Each wren day a captive bird, dead or alive, would be put on top of a decorated pole and paraded far and wide or placed in the centre of a holly bush surrounded by paper flowers. This strange task was carried out by the Wren boys, bachelors from the neighbourhood, masked and in disguise as animals or wearing straw costumes, and one of the men was always dressed as a woman. 
In some parts of Ireland, there would also be a white mare, a pantomime type horse. The Wren boys would make music, demand food or money from the crowds. At the end of the day, the Wren was placed in a coffin and buried, sometimes in hallowed ground in a cemetery, and this was seen as a returning to the earth returning the bird to nature as a sacrifice. And here we see another obviously pagan legacy becoming associated with Christian tradition, as with so many others. The gathered food and money would be used to hold a great dance, where these young bachelors could court young women and possibly find a wife. Life, death and rebirth in the whole traditional day. Another tale that leads to the tradition of the hunting of the wren is that of the mythology of Tay Tay, the fairy seductress from the other world who would seduce unwitting men to their deaths beneath the sea. They would follow her, obsessed, and as they reach to grab her, lose their footing in the water, she would transform into a tiny wren and escape their grabbing hands. From this tradition came the belief among fishermen from the Isle of Man that if they carried a dead wren on their boats they would be protected from wicked fairy seductresses while at sea. Another fairy woman the wren has associations with is Cleona, the banshee daughter of the Irish sea god Manana MacLear. Many of her stories feature her ability to shapeshift into a wren and escape danger or revenge. Later people adopted the folklore of never harming the wren as it was seen as a bird sacred to all religions. Those people who would raid a nest for eggs or chicks would have lightning strike their home and their hands would even shrivel up to useless things. In Wales, one of the Celtic countries that make the UK, the name of the wren also means druid a direct connection to an ancient Celtic faith and a bird sacred to the Celtic hero, poet and mystic Taliesin. The Celts also believed that to carry a wren feather would be a protection from drowning. Apprentice druids would wander the countryside at New Year in search of hidden wisdom. It was believed that to see a wren during this time would be a sign that the druid would be blessed with inner knowledge and insight into the year to come. Such a small creature, elusive to the point of invisibility, symbolising the elusive divinity within of all things to be revealed to the druid. In Scotland, the wren had the nickname the Lady of Heaven's Hen, and it was extremely unlucky to harm one. The wren, is also associated with artists, poets, musicians, writers, a harbinger of spring, rebirth, creativity, immortality and protection. And the Victorians, with their love of anthropomorphizing animals and birds, gave the wren another name. She became Jenny Wren. For such a tiny little creature, the king of birds has a huge presence in our hedgerows, the blackbird. Listen on an early morning or late in the evening as dusk falls and there is a beautiful song in the air, clear and pure, the song of the blackbird so familiar to us, and one of the favourite sounds of the garden. These birds are members of the thrush family and found not just in the trees but also hopping along the floor searching under leaves and in the soils for food. Bold and very striking birds, especially the males with their golden orange beaks. It has an interesting and peculiar folklore, the blackbird. In ancient Greece it was considered sacred to the gods and the goddesses, although it was also seen as destructive in many omens, and strangely it would die if it happened to eat a pomegranate. In the medieval era, the blackbird was often caught and eaten as food, giving rise to the nursery rhyme, sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing, 
or wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? At a time when diets would have been meagre, the blackbird along with other garden birds would have been in addition to the pot. The Christmas song, the 12 days of Christmas, there are the four calling birds. Originally, this was not calling birds, but collie birds, as in black as coal. Collie bird was a popular nickname for the blackbird, although the term calling bird also fits as their song is so beautiful. Surprisingly, for a bird with black feathers, it is not seen as bad luck, unlike other blackbirds such as in the rook, the raven and the crow. However, folklorists documented that it did have a suggestion of dark places. It was believed that to place the feather of a blackbird under someone's pillow would lead them to spill out all their secrets against their will. These birds are another bird associated with the dead, and this time as a messenger bird, a symbol of reincarnation. If you should see two together, a very unusual thing for such a territorial bird, good luck will follow you. A strange old tradition states that if a human hair is used as part of a blackbird nest, that person will suffer headaches, boils and skin problems until the nest is destroyed. In one beautiful tale, the Irish Saint Kevin from the 7th century was praying, hands outstretched in the ancient way. A blackbird landed on his hand and laid her eggs in his palm. He kept the eggs in his hand and refused to disturb them or move them until they hatched safely. The Celtic peoples believed that there were three creatures that were the oldest in the world. One was the stag, another the trout, and the third was the blackbird. These respectively were said to represent the earth, the water and the air. The goddess Rhiannon has three blackbirds that sit and sing in the world tree in the other world, the Isles of the Blessed. Their entrancing singing would lure listeners into a trance state so they could pass into this place and find out its mystical secrets. And this echoes many traditions that the song of the blackbird can be used to enter an altered state of consciousness for those seeking spiritual or otherworldly knowledge or help. In Italy, there is a lovely little folk tale that tells of a family of blackbirds that came to shelter there one winter. The weather was so cold that the family of blackbirds moved their nest from a tree to close by a chimney pot where they could at least gain some warmth. The father blackbird went for searching for food for his family. For three days he searched high and low, and when he returned home, his family had all turned black from the soot, where once they had all been pale and white. The blackbird is one of our most beautiful garden birds, and it is a joy to watch them bouncing around the garden. The Robin Redbreast One of the most striking of our garden visitors in Europe is the robin. Our friends in the United States have a different robin, but both have the familiar red markings associated with Christmas time and winter. I will tell you though now of the European robin. This sweet little bird is known in the United Kingdom as the gardener's friend. The robin is a symbol of good luck, happiness, rebirth, and, as with other birds, is a liminal being that can cross the two elements of air and earth, and so are known as messengers from loved ones who have passed away. There was even a tradition told that robins finding a dead body would cover the deceased with moss, straw and leaves, and yet no one understands why. It was always noted that these birds were drawn to wait with grieving families as a comfort until the body was placed in the ground. These striking birds were known by the Celts as the Oak Kings of Summer, and in Norse mythology they are associated with the god Thor, and so are the protectors against lightning and storms. In bygone Devon, the name of the robin was Robin Erdic. 
the root of this being the Anglo-Saxon name for Robin, Ruddock. It was the Victorians who gave the Robin its anthropomorphised name Robin, and before this time it was simply known as Redbreast. It was the Victorians that also began the association with Christmas. The image of the bird being used on cards and as gifts and decorations and this time the postman would wear a red jacket so it is from them with the deliveries of so many letters from loved ones far away that the traditional christmas robin delivering good fortune love and loving messages appears and yet in devonshire where the bird was seen as a bird of ill omen even Christmas cards featuring the robin were thought to bring bad luck to the home. In mythology there are many tales of how the robin gained his red breast. And there are two Christian stories I will tell you. In one the robin was a purely little brown bird. As Christ was dying on the cross, a splash of blood hit the robin when he was pulling a thorn from Christ's crown of thorns or a nail from his hand to ease the Lord's pain. The stain of the blood stayed as a mark to this very day as a message of the robin's bravery and compassion. In the other tale, the tiny bird was fanning the flames of a fire nearby the baby Jesus to keep him warm. The robin was working so hard that he did not even notice his chest had begun to burn red hot. This association with holiness in the Christian faith gave the robin some protection that other garden birds did not have. It was believed incredibly unlucky to harm one of these birds or even tamper with one of its nests. The association with the crucifixion though was one of the factors that gave the robin its association with death. It was believed that if a robin entered your house during any month of the year except November, it would herald the death of someone in the household, as would a robin tapping on the window. The same would happen if a robin flew into a church during a service. One of the parishioners would pass away soon. It was also a common belief to this very day that robins are messengers from our departed loved ones. There are many anecdotal tales of robins being a comfort to grieving families, representing the loved one who is no longer with them. These little bright coloured birds have a truly beautiful song that is very powerful for such a small bird. This song has become a symbol of hope and rebirth over the years. In Celtic mythology, the killing of a robin would bring about the destruction of that person's property by fire. And there is an Irish legend that tells us that the robin brought the gift of fire from the other world. First, the tiniest of birds, the wren, sneaked through the keyhole of that strange place and stole a piece of the fire. It squeezed back out and carried it as far as its tiny wings could, but it grew tired and way too hot. It gave the fire to the robin who carried it further and further and further until its breast was burned with the heat. The robin gave the fire last to the lark, who finally managed to carry the gift to humans, but the hard-working robin was forever red with heat. This fiery folklore echoes the robin's association to Thor, or sometimes Odin. The robin was closely aligned to the element of fire, as are both gods, especially Thor with his forge and the lightning strikes and the thunderclaps of his hammer. The robin therefore became the bird of storms and fire and sacred to the Norse gods. In England, to hear one would herald stormy weather, but in Ireland, a robin in the house was a portent of snowstorm or frost. Winter again in robin folklore. On Dartmoor in Devon in the southwest of England, it was believed and probably still is to this day that to take a tiny blue robin egg from a nest would cause all the milk from the area to discolour and to take a nest would cause all the crockery in the house of the thief to be smashed to pieces supernaturally. 
And there is another belief that should a robin hop over your threshold, that debt will soon follow him into the house. This cheery and feisty, tough little bird is one of the mainstays of Christmas and winter imagery, and the sight of one always brings a smile. Long may they always be a visitor to the bird feeder. The blue tit or titmouse. Garden birds are often shades of brown and tan, or deep rich brown almost to black, but now and then there is a splash of colour to brighten the bird table, and one of these is the very small and very cheeky blue tit. This pretty little bird has a number of interesting names. There is blue cap, blue bonnet, blue oxi, blue spick, nun, ped and play, tree babbler, pinchin, tinnock, yelp, bee bird, willow biter, billy biter, pick cheese, tom tit, hick male, hecimal, titmal and titmouse. Titmouse comes from the Middle English word titmose, tit being a pre 7th century Norse origin and meaning small object or creature. And Mose is also Norse, originally maize, meaning small bird. Eventually maize became mouse, and titmouse dates back as far as the 1300s, and Tom titmouse as far back as the 1600s. There isn't much folklore I could find about this little acrobat of the garden, but one common thing with so much other wildlife is that they are weather predictors. The Reverend Charles Swenson, published in 1885, tells us that the call of the blue tit warns of cold weather, and Walter de la Mer also wrote of the titmouse that this tiny son of life responded to the emerging hints of spring with bursts of song and vivacious swooping flight. Let's have a look at some of their peculiar names. There were those who called them Sela and saw them as prophetic, auspicious soothsayers, telling the future fortunes of men and women. The bee bird name comes from the tradition that blue tits wait at the entrance of beehives, waiting for their insect prey to emerge and swiping them as quickly as possible. The biter name comes from the extreme feisty defensiveness, the females who guard their eggs, they will peck anyone or anything in protection of their broods. These pretty and funny birds of the garden stay in families, protective flocks, chattering, arguing and yet always close to each other. And this is probably why we are drawn to them, because we too are family animals. They may be small, but they are some of the biggest, prettiest characters in the garden. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Tales of Fae and Folk. I've wanted to create another bird folklore episode for a while, as they are such a delight to watch. They give us so much joy and a real sense of accomplishment when they do come to feed from our garden tables. If you would like to help garden birds, and really no matter where you live, they do need our help right now, look for your national charity for bird protection. I will pop some links below in the description. Also look for local reserves and rescue centres near you because they always need funds and help. Helping our garden birds is so good for our mental health. I hope you enjoyed this time's telling of tales. And until next time, dear friends, as I will always say, take care, brightest of blessings and remember, don't play with the fairy folk or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.